there! Welcome back to another episode of I Love This, You Should Too, a podcast with me, I'm Samantha Hughes, and him, he's Indy Randawa. How are you, Indy? Not as good as you, I think. You sound um, full of pep and vitality. I am full of pep and vitality, because I had tequila. Oh, (laughs) so you're full of tequila. I'm full of tequila. I'm full of uh, remorse and anxiety. Oh, no. And chocolate milk. Oh, well, that kind of balances the scales a little bit. Yeah, so I'm pretty good because of the chocolate. Good, okay. So you're like high sugar, but low energy. High sugar, low spirits. Low spirits, sorry. Not That's, I'm going to get a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> high sugar, low spirits? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Story of my life. That's kind of sad. Well, today we each have a thing of the week for you, and then later I'll be telling Samantha and you and me what my pick for next week's movie is going to be. Are you drawing out of a hat? Uh, <laughs> yeah, kind of, actually. Oh, no. We'll get to that later. I know though. you were texting me today while I was at work, and you were like, have you seen this movie? I tried something new today and actually prepared for the podcast. Oh, well, that's exciting. So we'll see how this goes. I felt like I was writing a book report at lunchtime. That's how I feel all the time. <laughs> I write a lot of book reports these days. <laughs> so uh, we'll see We'll see if that goes any better. And you can let us know if I sound more prepared or if I should just wing it like usual. Everyone loves your off-the-cuff style. Yeah, I literally don't choose before we actually start podcasting, so... And sometimes I'll have pages and pages of yeah. notes, but then when I go off and do like a big rant and a big soliloquy, that's always top, off the top of my head. Yeah. You prepare, like you have things in front of you. Today, I actually like kind of wrote myself a script. That's exciting. Yeah. I wrote down some stuff as well because my thing of the week, well, I have kind of two because you know how I love uh, praising things I love. Yes. I also love condemning things I hate. Oh, is this a... So it's a double. A negative thing of the week. Here's something terrible. Here's a remedy for that terrible thing. Oh, I like that. That's a new twist. So my thing of the week is uh, Pablo Torre and his works. And you might not know who that is, but we'll get into it. Because my big thing I've been complaining about a lot lately is uh, sports journalism. Right. And I could do like a full episode on just sports. I kind of wanted to do like a, I love this, you should do sports. And then I would just talk about why sports are important. And like, we could do that. I it's don't... like theme episodes. I like that. Like a bonus episode every so often. Yeah, because I think a lot of non sports fans don't really consider the world of sports. I mm-hmm. think if you're from outside of that world, there's an image of uh, like single mindedness. It's often associated with conservatism. Or, like, brawn over brains, but I think you're doing it a disservice. And, like, we could go into all the social change that is brought about through sports before any other realms. Or how it's, like, one of the few vehicles for upward mobility in the United States. Or how athletes were at the forefront of the civil rights movement over a lot of, like, politicians and things. Or even how uh, today gender equality in pay is... um, those battles are being fought in the sports world before the corporate world. I do know about that. And also the like racial equality. Yeah, like the Minnesota Lynx in the WNBA, they were wearing back Black Lives Matter t-shirts in 2016. So like oh. four years before all the Twitter people were all over it. Or like how even it sports were a method of like anti-colonialism in the 1900s mm-hmm. or how it can be a great equalizer or how important it is to immigrant children because it means like it's a way into that world and it's a means of acceptance or how like as you know um how organized sports are so great for the ideas of uh, equality and leadership and responsibility Mm -hmm. in children but i just ranted for that's not my thing though (laughs) no that's okay no i was just gonna agree with you and say yes i do feel very strongly about the fact that like my coaching helps these kids become adults yeah, and it, them independence, it, it so. really does build great people yes. out of it. And you're, I'm sure people are going to be like, what about this athlete? He's a dick. And I was like, yeah, people are dicks everywhere. Uh, but anything. so many people, <laughs> I, like, I'm not an athlete. I grew up playing things, but mm-hmm. I don't, That's I'm not a professional or close to it. But I did, I do feel like I learned a lot mm-hmm. through going through all of that as a child. But um, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> Back <So>. on topic. <laughs> I guess I should just say, for people who know me, 
out there because I think I exist more in the the arts world than I do in the sports world. True. And like I do have this podcast and it's all about movies, but I actually would give up watching and making movies before I give up watching and playing sports. Like for sure, it wouldn't be uh, much of a question for me. And so people out there, if you're like, no, sports are dumb, because I know a lot of my friends are kind of like that. Talk to me. I'll tell you why they're amazing. It doesn't amazing. have to be like that. That's the thing. Like, I came from a world kind of similar to yours where you're, like, very artsy on one hand, but also, like, really into this sporty thing. And it, you can, just like Archie Andrews, you can play football and play guitar. Don't bring Archie to this because he couldn't. That was his big crux. I know. Oh, man. Is that show still going? I think so. Oof. Back to sports journalism and the right. problems they're in. So if you aren't interested in sports or sports journalism, I hope that you do listen to the next five, ten minutes I'm going to talk about it because this is, uh, will perhaps shine some light on a world that you might not be familiar with, but a world that's perhaps more complex and also very indicative of other parts of Mm -hmm. our world. So the state of sports journalism right now, if I do say, is terrible. And it mirrors our all journalism, because journalism in general, I think, is in a very bad place right now. And I know you can go into any period of time, and there is sensationalism and fear-mongering, and that's always existed. But right now, because we have that 24-hour news cycle, because right. there are, I don't know how many channels, because I don't watch TV, but there are so many 24-hour news channels... And the fact that because of social media, people constantly need something to complain about. There are so many more outlets for people to complain. And Mm. journalism as a whole is pretty terrible. But I'm not going to talk about all journalism because that's bigger than I can deal with right now. a whole podcast on its own. So I'll just tell you why I think sports journalism in particular is in such a bad place. And I think that does extrapolate out to, uh, to all journalism and just discourse about anything about film about politics and it's all it's all kind of the same in a, mm-hmm. in a lot of ways but sports journalism i feel is completely taken over by like hot takes and there's no accountability or credibility like all journalism people are most concerned about getting interactions with fans rather than informing them so you get a lot more attraction by saying outlandish things constantly than you do about researching or saying anything thoughtful. In regular journalism, although it's not regular, you had your Rush Limbaugh's and your Alex Joneses who were like just straight up crazy people, but super popular because they're constantly saying crazy things. And mm-hmm. then even if you're against them, you're talking about them constantly. Right. And in sports, you get your, we had Don Cherry in Canada for a good while, who doesn't even talk about sports, but he is like the biggest voice in sports for so long. Oh, I had like shut Don Cherry out of my mind because he's just like... He's the worst. He's it's terrible. It's sad that that is what a lot of Americans know about Canadian hockey. I didn't plan on talking about Don Cherry, <laughs> but in all of that uh, discourse about like, oh, this is PC culture, run amok, he's being canceled. Nobody bothered to mention that he is terrible at speaking about sports yeah. and speaking. He Just, cannot form no. sentences, and yet he was on he the air. He makes like no sense. But there's also like guys like Stephen A that we have all the time who is terrible. He's an American sports personality. He's not a journalist. He just uh, rants about nonsense constantly. And so, for instance, here in Edmonton, our hometown hockey team, the Edmonton Oilers, lost four straight games in the playoffs and they're out now. So if you're not familiar with them, they currently have uh, Connor McDavid, who's the best player in the world, pretty much unarguably, but Mm -hmm. people still argue it. And he has never won a championship. And for decades, this was a very commonplace thing. Like, most of the best players in the world didn't have playoff success early. Yeah. And it didn't come until much later in their careers. But those people weren't around during, like, Twitter. So they were allowed to just play the game. And not get harassed. Yes. I do feel bad for these guys because you have to remember that they're, like, 20. Yeah, but it's just... uh, It's one thing to complain about somebody's performance because that's like literally your job. Mm. But there's the discourse around this, like how people are talking about it is is just ridiculous because you have to have something to complain about. You have to have a hot take after every single game. So now there's like so many prominent journalists saying like, oh, he should never play for that team again. They lost. 
And then people are saying like, oh, he's actual was never any good because look at this. Who cares if he broke all those records? Yeah. He lost these four games. He breaks games. records every single season and he's like crapped upon in the media. But there's nobody talking about, hey, Winnipeg did a great job of just squeaking out all these wins. Mm-hmm. And you could make the argument that Edmonton outplayed them three games out of four. Oh, I but saw that's two of them. And yeah. not actually what we talk about because that's not fun to talk about. That's not exciting to no. talk about. And sometimes, you know, it's sports. It's luck. There is a lot of luck in it. But, of course, you can't just say that. Like, you can't take four games and extrapolate onto the history of a sport that's been around, a league that's been around for more than 100 years. And I think most of these journalists know that, but they know that they need to get retweets more than they need to say anything smart. And I think social media has been great because it allows people to tell their own stories, But the clear downside is now that everyone thinks that they're an expert and their opinion matters on everything. And yet your opinion matters on things you know about. Like there's a definite link between some guy on his couch claiming that he knows who a team should trade for to that same guy on his couch thinking like, well, I know who should be vaccinated and I know that they're bad. Yeah. Like you don't know. You just have an opinion and you have an outlet for it. So you think that pin opinion is valid. That people are listening, yeah. But it's not. But the thing is, people are listening because yeah. they would just want to fight or they want to be like, yeah, the most extreme attitude is the one that I'm going to agree with. And they just want to feel validated, right? Yeah. Like, I thought about this once and someone else said it on Twitter. So it must be true. Steve and I said it. So, like, now it's cool. Yeah. Or remember we were watching the the Super Bowl, the Atlanta, New England year, And Atlanta was uh, up by quite a bit, and a bunch of newspapers put together the front page, and we got to see those before the game was actually over. Mm -hmm. And the headline was um, how Tom Brady was never any good, uh, or about how his career is now over. And of course, he uh, orchestrated one of the best comebacks, went on to uh, win the game, went on to win several more Super Bowls, and I'd say maybe the best football player of all time, maybe Jim Brown. Probably Jim Brown, huh? It's tough. You know, see, I don't have as much opinion on that as you do. <laughs> but either way, with 15 minutes of extra football, the narrative went from his career is over and he was always overrated to he's the greatest player that ever lived. And it's just so reactionary that I hate it. And even if you're not a sports fan, you know that you can't judge a person's life by 15 minutes. And just like with Alex Ovechkin in the NHL, within two years, the conversation went from that he doesn't deserve to even be in the NHL, he's going to be cut by his team right away, Mm -hmm. to maybe he's the greatest player of all time. And now we're back to like, oh, he needs to leave that team if he wants to them to win he should sacrifice his career for their sake that's the newest thing that was today and (laughs) all of those very ridiculous takes yeah but uh, i'm not just going to complain i got all my complaining out so i have an alternative to the stephen a's and john don cherries of the world and that is a man named pablo torre (laughs) I love Pablo Torre. So I first became aware of him when he would guest host on this show, Pardon the Interruption, PTI, or uh, Sports Shouting, as it sometimes is. And he would guest host with one of my other favorite sports writers, Tony Kornheiser. And between the two of them, they would have the most incredibly thoughtful and intelligent takes on the world of sports and things outside of that world. But he would only get to guest host when one of the other hosts wasn't there. Oh. But recently, I started listening to the ESPN Daily podcast, which is hosted by Pablo Torre, and I think it's pretty fantastic. Oh. It's especially good and refreshing because he doesn't need to have a controversial take on everything. Right. He just has a really thoughtful approach and takes into account the history of the sport, which is especially impressive because he's one of the the younger guys in this world. I think he's a little bit younger than me, but he seems to have a a grasp on on the history and doesn't think that whatever happened in the last week is the most important thing all the time. And I also like that he doesn't claim to be an expert on everything, Mm -hmm. like despite the fact that he's clearly more knowledgeable than most people who think they are. 
So it's a daily show, so you get five a week, so they have to go through a lot of stories, and there's a lot of prep time in all of Mm -hmm. these. So a lot of the episodes, he turns them over to like a real expert on that specific thing. Like he brings in a correspondent from Moscow to talk about how uh, players are being threatened by the Putin government. And because it's like, yeah, he probably has a take on that, but he doesn't really know. He's not in Moscow. Right. So he defers to experts because I think one of the uh, signs of someone who is truly intelligent is knowing that your intelligence does not cover all fields. If you're really smart, you know why experts are experts mm-hmm. and you defer to them. Right. That's like, I don't know how a lot of vaccines work. I read about it, but I don't really know. Yeah. I don't develop the vaccines. So you know what? This person developed them. I'm going to listen to yeah, them on this exactly. One. And when he has these experts on, he listens to them rather than arguing with them. And because that's a thing that you see a lot of arguing with someone who clearly knows what they're talking about more than you do. But I'll just let you know what this podcast is about. So in the last couple of weeks, some of the stories have been about, uh, he did this one about the hesitancy in black communities about vaccination and how it applies to NBA Mm -hmm. players. And the story wasn't about like, hey, these people need to listen. He goes as far back as uh, starts talking about how gynecological tools and how they were developed on black women in America. And if you're not familiar with that part of history... um, which why would most people be, but they were developed on um, black women and they were used on them without any sort of anesthetic or anything. And then they figured, oh, if it's good enough to test on these people, we'll do it all here, often uh, without their prior knowledge or consent, without any Mm -hmm. anesthetic. And then it's like, oh yeah, so it worked. Now we can take these tools and use them on the Europeans and then deny black people Mm -hmm. the access to the things we developed with them and he even goes into like the tuskegee experiment and how all of this has caused a very like understandable distrust of the government and medicine in in those communities right so it always goes like a little bit further uh on mother's day the story was about him saying uh thank you and sorry for being an idiot about breastfeeding and just not knowing how much time that takes yeah. because he's like a new father and he's like i had no idea i think it's like every now and then so then he talks it's to all, <laughs> all of these uh athletes and coaches and how breastfeeding affects not just like their play that game but like their schedule their mm-hmm. training like how they have to pump right before the game and there's all these things that like yeah, I w- wouldn't have thought about mm-hmm. those things. He's willing to look into these worlds that he's not an expert on and yeah. just sit and learn. And he doesn't have like a take on, oh, here's why this is great yeah. or here's why they <laughs> should not do that. He just sits there and listens and it's like, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. And having someone say they don't know something is so rare. It is very right? rare, especially in journalism, because everyone just talks like they're the expert. Yeah. Not like they've interviewed four experts for the thing. They're like, oh, so vaccines, da 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 and this is why. And they never say, like, well, I did, like, 17 hours of research for this article. Exactly. <laughs> and sometimes the episodes are funny and lighthearted. A lot of the time, they're more straightforward journalism, like doing a deep dive into one story. Sometimes, like in those cases that I mentioned, they're tangentially related to sports, but they go into something larger that relates to the rest of the world. And then sometimes it's just straight up sports journalism, and it's very much about a single game. So if you're like a big sports fan, and you're worried that he doesn't actually cover games being played, then he does. Like, they might do a piece on uh they were talking about the la clippers and how the defensive matchups haven't been working for Kawhi leonard as well as they had in the past so he knows his stuff but then he's also not afraid to get into uh into other realms but i think what i like is that it's not just all that reactionary stuff he knows the sports he watches the games and he can actually speak about them intelligently without jumping to all these silly conclusions and that's not very common these days no kidding and he's also just like a really likable personality i think he seems like really genuine and sweet which is not something you think of in a sports journalist but, but he nice really and, is like approachable i like that yeah and he's like super smart the first thing i noticed about him is that he'll make references to things and mm-hmm. i was like wait i mean i've never heard that referenced by a uh, sports journalist and then i found out that 
he does in fact have a degree from Harvard, I think it's in political science, and his parents always wanted him to be a doctor. So he doesn't dumb down his speech, but he also never says like, oh, I went to Harvard or anything. He like never mentions that at all. It's just I happen to look that up about him. But instead of going on with his Harvard career or being a doctor like his parents wanted, he just thought like, you know what, I'm going to go into uh, sports writing, which seems very strange. Interesting. I like when people are like actually like educated and not just like people who were like maybe they were a great great athlete but like they have no like world experience to back it up yeah if you're an expert on one thing yeah right like i think it's a lot better to have someone like like this who has like a degree and who lived in the world but also knows a lot about sports yeah 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 he definitely seems like a well-rounded guy but yeah, so my uh, thing of the week, I guess, is the ESPN Daily Podcast, but more just the works of Pablo Torre, a Harvard-educated Filipino-American in his mid-30s that just happens to know a lot about sports. Hmm. I like it. Good job. How about you, Samantha? What is your thing of the week with all your pages and pages of notes? It's like a page and a half, so don't get too excited. It's still a lot. <laughs> My thing of the week is a book. And um, Indy, what do you know about rabies? Oh, a little bit. I know that has it has extremely high mortality rates. Yes. There's only been a few people, I think maybe like two or three, that have ever been cured of it. Yes. Once it got past a certain stage. I know that you used to have to get several injections into your belly. Mm -hmm. It was like five in a row or something. I thought it was like upwards of 12, but I'm not sure. But it's changed over the years. It has, yeah. Modern medicine. I know that one of the craziest things is that you get hydrophobia because of it, meaning you're very scared of water. Mm -hmm. I know that because of rabies, dogs are in the top five, I believe, of animals that kill people. Really? Yeah, because of rabies. Yeah. Um, is, is that enough? Should I go on? How I, long does it take to present symptoms of rabies? Four months. Six months to a year. Okay. So what if rabies developed within the hour? Then it would be a movie like 28 Days Later. Yes. So the book that I read is called Survivor Song. It's by Paul Tremblay, and it was published in July 2020. And it's set in Massachusetts during an outbreak of super rabies. Super rabies? Yes. Oh, shit, So man. instead of being a long, drawn-out, like, development of symptoms, you start showing symptoms in an hour, and those infected quickly lose their minds and are driven to bite and infect as many as they can. They're just, like, out of their minds. So it's pretty much like a, a zombie scenario. Yes, it's like a zombie scenario. And um, this one hit a little close to home just due to like the fact that there's like a pandemic out there. Mm-hmm. Nobody's biting anyone else, but it's just like... Well, there's some people biting people. It's a highly contagious thing out there that is killing people. So it's... The main character is a doctor named Dr. Sherman, who is attempting to help a college friend named Natalie, who's eight months pregnant. And Natalie and her husband were attacked by someone who had super rabies, and her husband died trying to fight this person off, and Natalie also got bitten. Oh, shit. So this is kind of, it's a very fast-moving book, but also... It, like, holds the suspense and is a little bit drawn out, if that makes any sense, that a book can be really fast but also drawn out. Well Because it's set over about 90 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it's, like, a full novel It's in 90 minutes. It was nine hours to listen to, and it was about 370 pages. Okay. Yes. So the whole story is about... um, Dr. Sherman and Natalie trying to get to a hospital that isn't either overrun with rabies patients and no longer functioning or um, is not turning away patients in case they have rabies so that they can continue caring for the people that they have. And so um, Dr. Sherman finds a private maternity clinic that will take them just based on the fact that she is also a doctor and um, they're hoping that they can save Natalie and the baby or just the baby depending on how long it takes to get there. Cool. Is Natalie also a doctor, or were you referring to Dr. Sherm? Dr. Sherman. Big Sherm, they Big call Sherm. her. Big <laughs> Sherm. Is that her name? 
No, it's Ramola. Ramola. Ramola Sherman. Yes. Hmm. I haven't heard that name. So the book kind of goes, I don't want to give too much away because it does have like some fun twists and turns, but they meet people along the way who either help them or who have started to take matters into their own hands due to the fact that like the world is collapsing due to this virus. And um, I found it really thrilling to listen to. I enjoyed how quickly it moved and how flashing back to um, Ramola and Big Sherm. Big Sherm, sorry. And Natalie's uh, college days sometimes kind of mirrored what was going on, like the chaoticness of what was going on in the present day. Um, And like I said, parts of it hit pretty close to home due to the fact that there's like an unknown or like an unseen virus out there right now. But it made it seem more real as I already had built in pandemic dread. Oh, no. (laughs) So that made it very like easy to really like get absorbed into this book because i was already kind of feeling it does the book take some of those standard tropes we see in zombie movies uh the more modern ones of so then they're out there and they find some people and they're well armed like oh but they're helpful but oh maybe they're too dangerous as well yes things like there's that. some fun like it doesn't it doesn't treat it like a classic zombie kind of story right like where like there's people just roaming the streets with the virus and you like have to you can't be smelled because you smell like a human or like whatever like the little tropes like that but um you definitely start to see people congregating as groups and trying to strong arm and like stronghold their resources and everything and uh that becomes like a big part of the book later on I think maybe you should watch zombie movies because the things you said that are the tropes, that doesn't happen. But the things you said this book does, that happens. Oh, okay. Maybe we should watch more zombie movies. Maybe I should change my pick to 28 Days Later. Oh, I haven't seen that. Or either of the Dawn of the Deads. So um, I'm not sure that this book would have been quite as tense if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. But um, I think that... If you are really tired about hearing about the pandemic and you just can't take any more, maybe skip this book because it definitely gives you that same kind of anxiety. But if you can handle a little bit more pandemic and a little bit more like crazy, unstoppable illness, then this is the book for you. I really like the idea that it only takes place over 90 minutes. Yeah. I've only read a few books that are within like a couple of hours mm-hmm. like that. And it's so different than the majority of what I read. It's like a really refreshing take. And even though the book might be long, it feels quick, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not with someone from birth to death. Like so much of what I read is. Yeah, it's great because it's it's as the virus is like kind of becoming effective within her body after she gets bitten. Right. So you're like watching her deteriorate as the book goes on. Is it a first person novel? Uh, it, it's in the first person of Dr. Sherman. Uh, okay. Yeah. I thought it'd be interesting if it was from the rabid person's point of view, because then, like, the, the text would change and the prose would become more erratic as things go on. You do get a little bit of that, but it's, like, it's probably, like, 70% Dr. Sherman and then the rest Natalie, um, because she's leaving these voice messages on her cell phone for her baby, because she just assumes she's not going to make it. Little Nat? L- little Nat Nat, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Big Sherm and Little Nat. Yeah. So uh, it's really interesting to see her kind of prepare. And then that's also where you get some of the college story because she'll tell stories and stuff about who is going to take over guardianship because they decide at one point that Dr. Sherman's going to take the baby if she doesn't Ooh. survive. So. I really want to ask you what happens, but maybe I'll do that after the podcast because we don't want to spoil it for anyone else. You can ask me what happens. I don't like I don't want to say anymore just because like it's got some really good twists in it. I'm pretty excited. That sounds like a very exciting read. Yeah. My friend Megan from book club recommended it. We're in a true crime book club. So a lot of the things that we recommend to each other are darker and scarier. Big thanks to Megan. Could you tell me the name of the book again? Yeah, it's called Survivor Song by Paul Tremblay. All right, so go check that out. You got it from the Edmonton Public Library, I I did, yes, I did. And you can get it as an audio book and an e-book and a regular paper book? All of the above. Wow. However you feel like reading this book. I've said multiple times on the podcast that I've, like, lost the ability to actually read things, so 
audiobooks are the way that I consume all my content now. It's very convenient. It is. You have to say it directly into my brain for me to say it, like to understand it. So, Indy. Yes. It's time. <gasps> for what? Reach into that magical hat and pick the movie that we're watching next week. So what I did, I often have like a plan. I didn't really have the plan. It's been an erratic little while. So yes. I went to my DVD cabinet. I picked up uh, three things pretty much at random. You said you'd seen one of them. So I now have two, which I'm going to mix up and put behind my back. Oh my God. <laughs> and you are going to pick one of my hands. And that's the movie we're going to do. Um, this is right and this is left. I'm going to go left. We are going to be watching the Wes Anderson film, huh. The Darjeeling Limited. Okay. Tell me about this movie. Are you familiar with Wes Anderson at all? Have oh, you seen his movies? I've seen a few. So if you are not familiar, he did a Bottle Rocket was his first one, or at least the first one that I know of. And then he did Rushmore, Royal Tenenbaums, Life Aquatic, The Fantastic Mr. Fox, Moonrise Kingdom, The Grand Budapest Hotel. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any of those? Um. I think I've seen like two or three of them. If I'm doing a Wes Anderson movie, and I do like his movies, I probably should have picked The Life Aquatic or Royal Tenenbaums, mm -hmm. because I th most people think Tenenbaums is his best movie, and I don't really argue. I think I like Life Aquatic more. But instead, we're doing The Darjeeling Limited, which is um, maybe his least successful and least well-liked film. Really? Yeah, but I do remember liking it. So I saw it when it came out in 2007. I went to the Princess Theater here in Edmonton yeah. and saw it in our little out art house one because yeah. it did not do very well, so it didn't go into most major theaters. Oh, interesting. I remember liking it then, but I was looking it up now, and there's like all these complaints that it's culturally insensitive, and I wonder if that's actually true. It takes place in India for the most part. Oh. And I uh, have seen a lot of movies that take place in India or have some relation to it, uh, both Indian cinema and then the terrible representations we get in American cinema. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember this one being particularly bad. It is a story about uh, three brothers. So you have three white American men going to India. So I think the criticism might be like, Oh, it's just foreigners going to India and right. it's their point of view. But I think that's the story. Okay. I think it is their point of view. It is their trip there. So right. I guess you could want it to be a different movie to be about Indian characters, but that's just a different movie. But we'll see if any of that uh, holds up. There is some stuff in it that I remember might be like icky at the worst, but not culturally insensitive, because I think the characters themselves aren't necessarily likable. Okay. But I think that's intentional as well. Do you know anything about the works of Wes Anderson? Like, how they look and feel? So I know that they're always very, like, colorful and really beautiful to look at. Yeah. Like, Grand Budapest Hotel, I remember seeing, and just thinking, like, how opulent the sets were yeah and that one was very like rose colored yeah. and purpley he definitely works with color palettes more than most modern directors mm -hmm. and i think in today if you are a very stylized director you're instantly called pretentious right which he might be or might not be but i don't think just having a definitive style and wanting things to look a certain way makes you pretentious right this one, of course, it takes place in India, so I think we're going to get a lot of that like saffron orange that's very popular, Ooh, right? Yeah. But again, I saw it in 2007, so I'm hoping it uh, it holds up. It seems like a lot of movies that he does, they are a movie that exists out in the world. They're a standard story that we see a lot of times, but it's just like a Wes Anderson twist on it. Mm -hmm. You could look at Life Aquatic and just say that's an action movie through the weird lens of Wes Anderson. Mm -hmm. There's so many movies that are usually about a single white female who goes and finds themselves in a uh, like coming of usually age. <laughs> India, maybe Thailand, yeah. maybe China, but they go there and they meditate and then they're like, oh, I get it now. And then they go back home and they marry a white man with a beard. Mm. 
<laughs> like that happens a lot. So they're also like airport novels. There's a lot of airport novels like that. True, very true. So I think this is kind of a Wes Anderson take on that airport novel mm -hmm. of going to a mystical land to find yourself. But I think this movie is told from the point of view of like, that's not how you go about doing that. You cannot force self-discovery. Right. It must be forced upon you. Wow, I haven't watched this movie, but I think I've created my thesis for it already. You haven't watched it? I haven't watched it in so long. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. This isn't, I think I'll like it. Well, I haven't watched it in, how many years is that? 14? When did it come out? 2007. Oh yeah, it's like 14 years ago. Well, let's watch a little trailer. Great. And see what this movie's all about. I think we have a chance to make this kind of a life-changing experience, and I think we need it. I want us to become brothers again like we used to be. You're the two most important people in the world to me. This is incredible! Why haven't we spoken in a year? Because we don't trust each other. Is that my belt? Can I borrow it? I want us to be completely open and say yes to everything, even if it's shocking and painful. Do you have any questions? I do. Okay, go ahead. What happened to your face? I don't know. I guess the train's lost. What do you say? It says the train's lost. How can a train be lost? It's on rails. That looks fun. I like it. It does. I'm glad I watched that trailer because before watching that, I was kind of more scared than any other movie I've brought so far, thinking that, like, I don't know if it's going to hold up. <laughs> because I my experience with it was pretty limited. I do remember really liking it at the time, but I feel like my tastes have perhaps matured. And I think the criticisms you could make about Wes Anderson are things that I was more forgiving of mm -hmm. in the past, like just trying too hard, the over quirkiness, mm -hmm. um, forcing the style over the actual message. And I worry about that, but I still think, I hope that it is going to be as good as I remember. I do remember parts of this movie being more literal than perhaps I would have chosen them to be. Mm -hmm. And I worry that it might be a little heavy handed. But if you're doing a movie that is about uh, emotional self-discovery, which I think that is probably what this movie is most about, I think maybe then that's the time you should be heavy handed. Right. Yeah, I agree. It looks like a Wes Anderson movie of like Definitely. what I know of. Like it's so saturated with color. Yeah. But um, I think it's going to be exciting to watch. And I think if nothing else, one thing I'm very confident in about this movie, mm -hmm. the soundtrack is amazing. Yeah. The, the music is the so good. The music in the trailer was fun. He used a lot of the music from um, some old Satyajit Ray movies. He mm -hmm. did these movies called the Apu Trilogy, which maybe at some point we'll cover. But I think that's when you're, uh, when we're really getting into it. <laughs> like classic Indian cinema is uh, maybe something that's that will come on this oh, podcast at some point. I'm They're excited. so good. I need to rewatch those. Actually, that's my plan for the summer: rewatch the Apu Trilogy. Oh. So, The Darjeeling Limited from 2007, directed by Wes Anderson, starring Owen Wilson, Adrian Brody, and Jason Schwartzman. And also, Irfan Khan is in it, and he's only in a little bit, but he's just great always. If you're not familiar mm -hmm. with him, as soon as you see him, you'll be like, oh, that guy, he's in everything. Yeah. And if you think he's in everything going into American film, you should you can't imagine how many Indian films he's oh, in. Oh, I'm sure. He's, uh, yeah, he's great, and he has a small part. Also, little bits from Bill Murray and Angelica Houston as well. So you can check it out. We'll put a little link in the show notes where you could possibly watch it there. Also, it's currently on Disney Plus through their whole star thing now. Mm -hmm. So you can watch it there if you have Disney Plus. Oh, awesome. I like that this movie is available to the people. Yeah, they have most Wes Anderson stuff I looked today. Oh, interesting. They must own the license. I'm excited. To watch this movie. You know what? I'm making a uh, a nice vindaloo today. Maybe this would be a time to watch it. Oh, that would kind of yeah. go well together. Yeah. Hmm. 
Next week, we'll be back when you hear what I thought of the Darjeeling Limited. And if I still like it even. Yeah, so we'll see you next week when we find out our reactions to the Darjeeling Limited. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Like in those cases that I mentioned, they have something that's kind of tangen- tangentially, tangentially, tangential, tangentially. Tangen- <laughs> that was the worst. Uh, tangibly? Tangentially. Tangentially. Maybe I'll just say it fast and then everyone will be like, yeah, that's pretty much right. Perfect. They're tangentially. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should leave it in of us both trying to say it. <laughs>